try a recording class with this GoPro, and then um, hopefully this will this will work. And then I'll post it um, for people who don't come or if you want to review it. But I also have online classes, and I'm going to post it for them so that they have something more than just whatever is there online. So, um, and I, I want to review with you guys again. We're going to hit these four noble truths, and Look, this is worth going over and over and over again because really, this is the essence of Buddhism. And if you understand these Four Noble Truths, everything else is just kind of icing on the cake, right? It, or, or filling in the gaps or helping you to, to get a bigger picture of the same things, right? So the first one, we started with the idea that life involves suffering, but now we're sort of describing it more as the first noble truth just describes for us the nature of existence, right? What it is to be alive. And if you'll remember, there are three qualities to the nature of existence. All things that exist have this basic truth. Right? Anita, anatta, anika, and dukkha. Now, um, anatta is the notion, again, of not-self. Anika is impermanence. And dukkha is resistance, right? Or I, I like to think of it as friction. But here again, a lot of times dukkha gets this negative. Uh, impressing, you know, like, oh, okay, so one, one example of dukkha, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, uh, well, I'll try to use examples again today, but when you're, do, you, do any of you wake up to an alarm clock? Yeah, so when that alarm clock goes off, there are probably some days when you're like, okay, it's, it's good, let's go, but then most of the time, probably, it's like, oh, right, like, I'm not ready to get up yet, hit the snooze. Do you have even a routine for how many times you'll hit the snooze button when the alarm goes off before you finally get yourself out of bed? Some of that is not because your life sucks and you don't want to deal with the day or any of that. Sometimes it's just your body is tired, your mind is shut down, and that alarm kind of interrupts. And what you experience is an immediate kind of drag or weight. It, you gotta shake off the the cobwebs or something, right? And uh, so that's dukkha, right? This kind of resistance. Uh, it's it's the general term for any time you feel something like that. But it's also dukkha can be something like this. Like, say you sign up to do a marathon. You really want to run a marathon, and like nobody's forcing you to do this. Like there are people who do this all the time. You might wonder why in the world are we people who do these kind of things, right? Like you just draw a line somewhere on a street and then you go 26.2 miles down the road and you draw another line and you go, I'm just gonna run from here to there, why not? And like, if you think about it, well, I can think of a lot of reasons why not. It's gonna hurt. <laughs> like, you're gonna beat yourself up. You're probably gonna get injured. Uh, the bigger question would be, why? Why, why would anybody wanna do that? Like, just draw two lines on the road and say I'm gonna run from one to the other. If you're gonna do that, why not make them like 10 feet apart? Right? Like, why go 26 miles? And for some people, 26 miles isn't enough, right? They wanna do 50 miles. There are 50 mile races, right? And then there are other people who are like, no. Oh, 50 miles, no, I want to do 100 miles, right? We have these 100 mile races. And then there are other people who are like, well, 100 miles, that's for, that's for the wimps. We're gonna do these 24 hour challenges, right? Where you just run for 24 hours and see how far you can go around a high school track. And they just run for 24 hours and do however many miles you can get out. And then there are other races called like the last man standing race, where people, all race together, they all start together, and they do one lap, and then they get like two minutes, or five minutes, or whatever the rules are, and then they do it again, and then they get five minutes, and they do it again, and it's like a five mile or a six mile loop, 
and they just keep going until you're the last man standing, the last one who can finish the whole lap. And sometimes these races will go for 160 miles or more before finally they can't do it anymore. There's no limit to how long this could take. It's just every time the horn starts to start another lap, whoever's there does it. And you just keep going. Why do people do this? This is Duca, right? Like, this is seeking Duca. This is like saying, I want resistance. I want to find where I finally run out, right? Like, that's what people are doing. So why do people sign up just for a marathon? I know we made it sound like, oh, well, a marathon's easy. No, a marathon is really hard, right? Like, why do people do that to themselves? There's clearly something about us that seeks our limits, that wants to push against our limits, right? That wants to find those points of resistance and overcome them. And in this way, we're talking about dukkha, not in a negative way, right? In this way here, like sometimes we want resistance to overcome it, to challenge ourselves. Because the feeling you get on the other side of it, right, of having accomplished something so difficult, something that takes time and energy and effort. And so if you set a goal, say, to run a marathon, do you think that every morning or every day as you're training for that marathon that you're like, yes, I get to go run today? No, right? So it's not just that this is a moment of dukkha, but every day as you train you have these little moments of resistance that you need to overcome and the world is full of that so you, you would be mistaken if you thought that what buddhists think is that this is always negative right this is neither negative nor positive there is nothing about anatta anika and dukkha that's bad in and of itself it's not there's no such thing what you'll see here in the nature of existence as a description of reality, it's neither positive nor negative. It's just what there is in the world. And the more that you see it for what it is, the more you can live with it to bring you happiness, right? So I just gave you some examples of how recognizing the positive value of dukkha in your life can bring you happiness right like you want to go to school to finish your degree even if it doesn't bring you another career mm -hmm. because you're going to overcome the resistance that school presents you're going to accomplish something that you set your mind to doing and that brings with it a kind of satisfaction or happiness that's independent of what you get you know like i'm going to get this diploma and i'm going to get a better job but the satisfaction and happiness comes just from experiencing dukkha, right? Does that make sense? So don't think, this is why I don't like the, the typical explanation of the first noble truth is life is suffering, because that makes it seem like Buddhists are like, oh, life is suffering, right? Oh, boo, 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 boo. It's so bad, it's so bad. But that, they don't have a bad quality to this. It's just, this is what life is. There's no self. Everything is constantly changing, and we experience resistance. And if you accept that, if you recognize that that's reality, it's neither good nor bad, except as you deal with it, right? And so that brings us to the next noble truth. There is nothing inherently bad about this. There's nothing that makes us unhappy about this, except for this, that most of the time when we experience dukkha, we wish it would just go away, right? So most of the time, when we hit the snooze button on our alarm, what we're signaling is, I don't want dukkha right now. This is not what I want to experience. Life, resistance, difficulty, friction. Please just make things easy. Time out, right? So that's where we experience dukkha is unhappiness. But the dukkha isn't unhappy. It doesn't, doesn't mean unhappiness at all in and of itself. It's how you choose to deal with it, right? So life is always going to bring it to you. But it's just usually we're like, I don't want to deal with that. I wish it would go away. 
And that's where we find unhappiness, right? It's in our minds that we say, ugh, ugh, I don't like that, right? But when we sign up for a marathon, we're like, bring it on, right? So how you approach these things determines whether you're going to be happy or not, whether you're going to be satisfied or not. So our, um, I'm going to put it this way, our mind determines our unhappiness, right? So here, what I, what I want to emphasize here, and maybe we're going to say it this way, our mindset, right? That's, that's another way to think about. Instead of thinking about it, so, so sometimes the second noble truth, and I've even described it to you before, as um, desire is the cause of suffering, right? That's how we've talked about this in the past. But you should understand, desire is just a mindset. Right? It's a way of approaching reality. It's a way of approaching anatta, anika, and dukkha, right? It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an attitude or a mental disposition, right? And so our mindsets can run in various ways about the things in the world around us. And we've already um, talked about some of these. So um, greed, avoidance and ignorance these are the primary mindsets for Buddhism right um, when we are in any one of these mindsets or a another way we might say it even uh, this is maybe too philosophical a word our disposition or I'm even going to call it this, though, so our mood. Have, have you ever experienced this? Where um, one day you're in a good mood. Things just are going your way. And something that would normally be really annoying doesn't bother you. Right? That happens sometimes. And then there are other times when things are not going so well and you're in a bad mood and then something that wouldn't normally bother you just makes you snap right you just can't deal with it you just don't have the patience like you, you work at a library i bet there are times when people come and ask you really stupid questions or do really stupid things in the library Maybe kids come after school and they start making all kinds of noise and throwing books around or whatever else, and other librarians get upset with this, right? Does this happen sometimes? Probably, right? Depending on your mood, you can deal with that well or get really annoyed by it, right? Um, so your disposition or your mood, it's like your foundational sort of uh, beneath the surface predisposition to how you're going to handle the world, right? And a lot of us don't think we control this. Right? Like moods just come and they go, and sometimes you're grouchy and you don't know why. But when you're grouchy and you don't know why, then everything is just more annoying, more easily annoying. And sometimes you're in a good mood. And, and then things are not annoying. That's kind of what your mood is or your mindset, right? It's this sort of underlying tendency. Buddhists say that if you get good enough at practicing, we'll see the Eightfold Path here in a minute, this is in your control. You can choose it. You can skillfully develop the, the ability to put yourself in the right mood, always, so that things don't undermine your ability to stay calm and at peace, that nothing can annoy you, right? If you remember the, the steps of Siddhartha's enlightenment, he realized all of his past lives, and then he realized the cause of suffering. He realized that the real cause of suffering is my mood. 
because it's your your mood or that underlying inclination to take things one way or another as good or bad or to be able to handle them well or not that is actually your experience of happiness or not whether you are happy or not isn't about whether your phone is working or your car is working or people are being good in the library or whatever it is it's the feeling you have of being you right now right how do i feel being me well then that's unhappy right and i saw yesterday i was driving in uh, naperville and i saw a rolls royce i thought you would like this it was a rolls royce a really nice sporty rolls royce two-door kind of a sports coupe like a gt rolls royce no? it was a race yeah i think it was a race yeah you know the models mm -hmm. but it was you know how it's gotten to be kind of fashionable to make them look like they're bright neon plastic paint mm -hmm. sort of things so its sides were this bright neon green and then the middle of it was this dark sort of rolls royce phantom gray right. and i just thought what a waste mm -hmm. like why would you make it look like a cheap maxbox car that is a beautiful car otherwise right, right. um but this is what made this guy happy i guess right but look sometimes i bet you he's driving in his rolls royce and he's like this is the best car ever i love my car so cool and then there are other times i bet you he's driving his car and he's like i'm late for work i gotta get to work and he's not even appreciating the fact that he's in a beautiful rolls royce he's thinking about other things and he's upset about this or that or i don't know maybe his wife was yelling at him and the dog is pooping in the neighbor's yard and he's got all these other problems and can he appreciate being in this rolls royce that is this awful green color that he apparently really loves right no he can't appreciate it why not because his mood is off mm -hmm. so that he can't be aware of and enjoy where he is what he is his life as it is because he's over here somewhere right trying to avoid he's greedy or he's ignorant of the reality happiness is only an immediate experience of your mood it's nothing else so if you think happiness can be 